Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on Electrical Distribution System Modeling and Analysis in MATLAB and Simulink. My name is Graham Dudgeon, I am an Industry Manager at MathWorks. There are four motivators for this webinar today. The first is connecting measured data to simulation. With the provision of highly accurate measured data, how can we benefit from that data in a simulation context? We benefit from it by connecting that data to simulation. The second is applying optimization to simulation. We're seeing this certainly with model calibration for generation equipment, applying formal optimization techniques to validate the parameters of the models, but in a broader sense, we can apply optimization techniques in a, in a much wider context across simulation models. Third is generating code from simulation models. So given that are, there are multiple platforms out there for doing simulations, then generating code becomes an important aspect of being able to integrate with other platforms. The final motivator is data analytics. How can we apply more sophisticated analytics to the outcome of simulation studies? For example, Monte Carlo studies, running simulations tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, and then doing a statistical analysis to, to gain a statistical significance on the outcome of that study, rather than just doing a, a few point cases. Within the context of the four motivators that we have, there are seven specific areas that we're going to be looking at today. I'll, I'll just read the list here and give you some additional insight into this. We'll be looking at creating models into SIM power systems automatically. We do this by using MATLAB and writing MATLAB scripts that can automate that process. We'll look at unbalanced load flow, so steady state computation. So within a time domain simulation framework, which is Simulink, how do we construct our network so that we can move from operating point to operating point and capture those steady state conditions, i.e. capture the load flow conditions. We'll also look at how we can generate code from SimPower Systems models using Simulink Coder. We will go back into MATLAB and look at the publish feature which we can use to automate the generation of reports which can contain engineering information. And certainly for complex engineering studies, the automated report generation is a, is a key value add. We'll then look at Monte Carlo studies running simulations tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times and how you can look at assessing the risk associated with those studies by applying statistical techniques and looking for statistical significance of the outcome of simulation studies. We'll also quickly look at integrating EMT components into, into phaser models and finally looking at optimization and bringing optimization techniques in with a, a simple example of looking at smart management, so a demand response of plug-in electric vehicles is the simple example we'll be looking at and how you can bring that optimization framework into the simulation context. We're going to be using the IEEE 123 node test feeder as the benchmark model which we will use to show the tasks in this webinar. I would like to acknowledge the original citation by Bill Kersting on the test feeder. You can see the details there and the URL at the bottom is a location where you can find further information on the details of this test feeder. This is just a screen capture of the network. We'll, we'll see that later on, but for those of you familiar with this network, you will recognize the structure. The first challenge is to create models automatically in SIM power systems. There are three main reasons why you would want to go down this approach. The first is developing a large model manually is time consuming and requires considerable effort to verify the correctness of topology, components and parameters. There will be many of you out there who have attempted to put together large models and have been successful. If you're doing this manually, then I am sure that you will agree with this first point. We also find that there can be a reluctance to re-implement a network which is already described in an existing file format, perhaps for another power system simulation environment. We do recognize that there are a number of different power system simulation tools out there, and certainly being able to read file formats, either from Excel files or, or from specific formats, is a value add. And the final reason once you have a larger scale model implemented in SIM power systems, then the reason that you may want to use the SIM power systems environment 
is that there may be a need to perform a study that is difficult to achieve or not possible to achieve in other software. So some examples of the added value of coming into this Empower Systems environment. You may want to apply optimization techniques to your simulation. It may be parameter estimation, for example. You may want to have an environment where you can feed in measured data directly to drive a simulation with measured data. For example, you may have solar data or wind data measured from the field which you may want to bring in and see the impact on how that's affecting the network response. Up at the transmission level you may want to do this with synchrophaser measurements for example. And another type of study you may want to conduct is Monte Carlo type studies. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different scenarios you may want to run through and the Simulinx and Power Systems environment is a convenient way of being able to specify a very large number of scenarios that you want to run through. The way in which we create a model automatically in some power systems is to write a MATLAB script that can interpret a network description and automate the creation of the network. This can be done because Simulink components are objects that can be manipulated programmatically from MATLAB. I'll show you some code snippets as we go through this webinar. I won't dwell too much on the code, but I will show you some examples of how it's done. You'll see functions such as add block and add line, which are used to create the topology of the network. And there are also functions that manipulate object properties and parameters. You'll see get param, set param, get and set. So they're all used within the scripts that do this automatic construction of the network. We will be running a specific type of simulation. I've called it pseudo steady state simulation for want of a better term. Perhaps quasi steady state simulation would be a better way of describing it. The reason that we want to do this is it's an approach to perform unbalanced load flow computations within the framework of a time domain simulation. Simulink, some power systems, is a time domain environment. And so using this approach, it's a natural approach to bring out typical load flow values. Also, because we're in a time domain environment, it does allow efficient configuration and execution of Monte Carlo studies. The way that we do this is we simulate the network in phaser mode. And the components that are connecting to the network, such as loads and the transformers, tap changing transformers, they're designed to have very high bandwidth so they can move from one operating condition to the next very rapidly. Now with this approach the transient response is ignored. The transient response has no physical significance in a simulation such as this. We could think of it, it's, it's analogous, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's analogous to the convergence iterations of a traditional load flow algorithm. The steady state response is equivalent to load flow and this technique is inherently multi-phase so we can bring this to multi-phase systems it's ideal for unbalanced load flow on distribution system networks I have a screenshot here of a typical run there's nothing profound about this but what this shows you is a a movement from operating condition to operating condition blue is the the simulation as it's running we can see transient regions as it's moving from one to the next we are ignoring those and we're picking off the steady state conditions which are the red dots. Let's go to MATLAB. I'll go to the create model directory. I'm going to bring up one of the scripts, the line placement script, and we'll look at that in a moment. But what I would like to do is run the script create IEEE123 that creates the actual model. I've put TikTok around it and we'll just let that run. Now what you're seeing here are the buses being placed. So they're being placed in locations which are equivalent to the locations on the IEEE 123-node test feeder diagram. I basically picked off the XY coordinates from that diagram and used them here. We now see it's moved on to the line placement I'm not sure about the rendering on your screen, but you may be able to see the multi-phase, three-phase, two-phase, and single-phase connections in this. 
The dark blue components are line components which have tap changers connected to them. And so this is just running through the lines. When it's done with the lines, it will place the breakers, which are red, and then it will place the loads, which are yellow. And once it's done that, it will put in some data saving components under the hood on the on the buses and on the lines. So we're measuring voltage at the buses, currents in the lines. We're using two file blocks here for this. Now the reason I use two file is because we've got a lot of data. Scopes were not really relevant here. You could use scopes, one or two scopes placed to to view how the how the simulations are running, but I found that scopes were not useful in this case. Two file blocks are very useful because they will also save data incrementally to the files, which is beneficial for longer duration simulations. So if you're running these pseudo steady state simulations for a long period of time capturing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of operating conditions, then certainly saving the data to file is a very effective way of doing this. So the model is complete. It's saved as a new name. And let me just show you some of the snippets of code that do this construction. So with the line placement, we're looking to see if there is a tap changer connected to a specific line. If so, we can bring in here we see add block. I'm saying if there is a onload tap changer flag set, bring in a specific block which has the tap changer connected. Otherwise, bring in the normal line block. We'll take a look at that library in just a second. So I'm using handles here to get the handles of the buses that the lines connect to, get their position. I add the line in the midpoint of the position. Set line is another function called to bring out the configuration data, populate the lines with the data from the, the text files in the benchmark. I'm just going further down here so we can see the, the add line. So here's the add line which is connecting the buses to the line components. The pause incidentally was so you could see this network build visually. If you're doing this in a engineering task, I would recommend removing the pause and building the networks in memory because it is quicker doing it in memory. Visual rendering is fine for this webinar, but there is an overhead associated with it. I would build these models in memory, particularly if the models are, are larger than this one. What I'd like to do is, before we look at some results, is actually go back to the benchmark data and show you an example of one of the Excel files. So we take a, take a look at spot loads and open as text. You can see, you know, the format of this data, node number, what type of model it is, either star or delta, whether it's PQ, I or Z. So constant PQ, constant I, constant Z, and what the values are. So this is all being loaded up automatically. And I'll show you an example. We'll go back to the create model directory. So we can look at one of the libraries. So delta constant PQ. We can take a look at that. You can see three phase, three phase, two phase because it's a delta connection. So we'll, we need to bring out the other phases. So single phase will be connecting across two phases. So this is why we have this configuration. But let's look under the hood constant PQ here being fed by data which is being automatically populated and fed in at a specific timing sample so we can do Monte Carlo studies constant PQ blocks connected in Delta if I go to the two phase you'll see it's two phase but the three phases are brought out for appropriate connection if there are any components in the network that are class is two phase delta and single phase just what you would expect so we've run the simulation now I can go to compare results but before we 
run that. Let's go back to the PowerPoint slide, which takes us to our next challenge, which is automating reports. The reason that you may want to do this is preparing a report of a complex study and or preparing regular reports can consume considerable overhead. So you can start seeing the theme here. We're looking at how MathWorks tools can help reduce the time you take to perform studies, to initiate a study, perform a study, and report on a study. The way that we're going to use report generation is there's a feature in MATLAB called Publish. We're going to be taking a look at that. And I'm going to open the compare benchmark file. Now you can see here I've used the double percent signs, which is section mode, but they will also come out as headers within or titles, section titles in a in a report. I have certain lines of codes which I'm running to do the comparisons. Now if I go to the publish tab and look at the publishing options. I'm going to publish to HTML in this particular case. Options you have, XML, LaTeX, Doc, PowerPoint and PDF as well. There are also other settings. You see here for code settings include code true or false. I'm going to set that to false because I don't want the lines of code coming up in the report. If I then just press publish it's going to take the results from some power systems it's going to take the results from the benchmark and it's going to generate a report for me to do a comparison which we'll take a look at. I'll just take a moment to do this. So this is a very efficient way to get a report out and particularly if you're per performing studies that are consistent in reporting format and this is a very powerful technique to save considerable time on the reporting. So here's HTML. We can see it's hyperlink to the sections. With PDF you'll also see um, section links as well. So I've just put a figure in here about how I calculated the relative error between the benchmark result and the SimPower Systems result. Uh, for bus voltage relative error we see that all buses on all voltages on all phases are below 0.1% relative error. If we look at the statistics of this, we have a box plot for each phase. We can see the mean error is well below 0.07% in all cases. What you're also seeing here are the 25th and 75th quartiles. Box plots are a very convenient way to get a statistical snapshot of what's going on. With current, we had a few currents going above 0.1%, but generally, when we look at the statistics, it still looks extremely good. Phase A was a bit more variable compared to the benchmark, but I deemed those results to be good enough to verify the model against the benchmark and then to move on with the, with the additional tasks that we're going to look at. We'll see another published report later on, but this is just you know, a quick, short report generation which is very effective and saves a lot of time in the reporting. So we're now going to look at generating code from SIM power system models. There are a number of reasons for doing this. First, it facilitates the, the transfer of the, the Simulink SIM power systems model into other simulation environments. So in itself, it, it doesn't enable it, but it's the first step. Get the code, and then you, you can look at connecting to other platforms, whether it be through DLL connectivity or other means. You can protect intellectual property, give you better configuration control by locking down the model, and it can also allow more rapid execution of multiple simulations. So let's take a look at how we do this. We need to be sure that we separate the input values and the output values from the model. So in this particular, I'm going to show you more of that, but we have a block here for the inputs, and that could be the PQ inputs or any other inputs that are varying as time progresses. You want to separate those, have them in a, in a separate subsystem. Same goes for the output values, the measurements have them on a separate subsystem as well. So we're going to run the function that builds this and what's going to happen is it's going to build the model underneath this subsystem IEEE 123. It's going to put all the input values into the input values subsection and then the outputs into the output values. So let me just run this and we'll see this in action. 
So it's now started to build. It's not a great deal you can see here at the moment, but if I double click on the IEEE123 block and then click the space bar, then we can see it building underneath that subsystem. And as it's doing this, then when it's completed the electrical system, it will then populate input values and output values. So this will take a, a moment or two to, to run. The reason we have to separate the input values and the output values is they, these are the values that are going to change as we run through different scenarios. So the electrical model in itself is a self-contained unit. What we're changing is the PQ values that are being fed into this model and obviously the output values are changing as well. And so they have to be separated because ultimately we're going to make the IEEE123 model uh, an S function in this particular case. It's now saving now. You can see there the name's changing to IEEE123 complete S function. Another few seconds and that will be done. Okay, that's the, the model built. If we look under input values, you can see here there's a number of input blocks if we go underneath. And you can see it's feeding in the values and then using from and go to blocks in order to get access to the simulation model, which is in another subsystem. Look at this, it's fully populated now. And then the output values, double click, then we've got measurements going to two file blocks. So now that we have that, we could run it as, as is, and it would run exactly the same as the, the model that we've seen before. But the process we go through in order to build an S function is we take the power GUI, which is currently in the top level, we move it in. I'm just cutting and pasting the power GUI into the subsystem here. So now it's in there, if I come back out, it's now transferred across to that subsystem. And then I can right click, choose C, C++ code, and then generate S function. I'm not going to run it here in the interest of time, it does take a few minutes, but what would happen is Simulink will go away and it will build the S function and then you will arrive at a block a subsystem which is exactly the same, except it will have C code underneath it. So I'll just bring this down and show you one I prepared earlier. So this is it here. If I double click on it, it says Simulink Coder Generated S Function. So Simulink Coder is required for this. If I look underneath the mask, the green is the C code is contained underneath there. We, we can't access that C code directly. But you have inputs which are all go to and from blocks to access the input output information of the model. So I can run this now. And there we go, it's just, just a short duration run. Just close this down. You can take a look at the C code, we're not going to dwell on it, but I'd, we have a S function directory created which contains a C code. Uh, you see there's a number of files here and the model itself double click on this C file we don't need to dwell on this but there you have it, you have a, a C code version of this SimPower Systems model okay this warning here incidentally when I cut and paste that power GUI block into the subsystem some power systems warned me and basically deleted the other the other model as a consequence of that. So now we move on to risk assessment. The reason it's important is uncertainty in system response cannot be confidently assessed unless the outcome of a study has an accepted level of statistical significance. This is particularly important with variable generation. Solar and wind it's very important to be able to look at the operation of the networks in a statistical sense. Another benefit of coming into the time domain environment and doing pseudo steady state simulation is you're maintaining the, the load flow type computation 
but you're also able to bring in certain aspects of operation maybe a failure of a component can be readily achieved or in the case I'm going to show you in a moment I've broken a tap changer basically a tap changer cannot achieve its maximum tap settings so I've limited its ability to move, move up the taps and we're going to look at a Monte Carlo simulation the output of that to see if we can visually detect this and so that's the case I've, I've chosen in, for, for the example Monte Carlo is a well accepted approach for risk assessment and also the, the value that I spoke about earlier of being able to bring in measured data can bring the result of a simulation closer to reality. The example I'm going to show you is an example where I just modified the loads using random number generators. I just used normal distribution. I ran a hundred thousand simulations for the case where the tap settings are fixed at the benchmark settings and then I've run a hundred thousand settings where the tap changers are active and able to modify based on their current conditions but there is a broken tap changer within there. Now I'm not going to run the simulation because it, it takes half an hour or so to run it but I will show you the report. So if I go down into the directory I've called Monte Carlo I have files that do the simulations for Monte Carlo I'm not going to run it here, I'll just show you basically the high level file we can set the tap changers to be fixed and then run the simulation or we can fix them to be or we can set them to be active and then run the simulation again and as I said I've done a hundred thousand cases for one and a hundred thousand cases for the other I'm just going to bring up the report which was published and the reason I'm bringing this up is to show you one way in which you can look at this data so what I've done is I've looked at two views I've looked at histograms of the voltages red is where the taps are fixed green is where they are active and I've also put these box plots in as well so we're looking at a statistical interpretation of the of the simulations of the Monte Carlo simulations I've done this basically presented the data on a bus by bus case phase by phase case so you can readily look through this information but let's actually scroll down I'm just going to scroll down there's a specific type of response I'm looking for so visually checking these responses out there are some intriguing which you may want to look at a little bit more certainly being able to scan these responses does give you that visual interpretation and allows you to very quickly discover profiles which may require you to look a little bit further at what's going on I'm going to keep scrolling my apologies for the speed at which I'm doing this I'm trying to get to a specific response So you can see it here that if you were to do this manually as well, put this report together, it would be quite cumbersome. So quite complex reporting can be done, or reporting that requires lots of information can be done quite readily with the pub publish feature. There we go. Now I'm starting to see some interesting things. Bus 67 it's the green response where the active taps are on and I can see this fat tail on the response I can also see it as outlier outliers on the box plots so we're starting to see outliers on one side of the response but not the other so there is something going on we're starting to see in it see it here as well so downstream from bus 67 we're starting to see the fat tail effect if we look at phases B and C we don't see it we see it on phase A so this is a visual indicator that phase A has something wrong just the, the way the responses are looking is an indication that tap changers are not working correctly I can go to the tap profiles so here are the tap profiles 
and bus 160 is the one I'm looking at. So the range is plus minus 16 on the taps, getting up to tap 11, but it can't go any further than that. And indeed, that's what I broke. I did not allow the tap setter on phase A to go above 11. And we're seeing the impact of that on the voltage profiles. Looking at the statistical plots can help you get to the bottom of what's going wrong. Also, got current responses. There's nothing too dramatic about those. There's no point in me dwelling on the current responses. Now we'd like to move on to hybrid phaser EMT simulation. Why do we want to go down this approach of combining a phaser system level model with EMT components or smaller EMT areas? Well, EMT studies are focused generally on localized areas of a larger grid. But when we're looking at those localized areas, we really do want to be sure that we're capturing the condition at the interface of this localized area with the larger grid. And to be able to do this, it's important to capture a level of detail appropriate for the study. So nothing remarkable about this. And certainly if you were to go down a full EMT simulation of the, the full system, there would be a significant computational overhead. And in fact, there would be lots of information contained within that simulation which you are not actually interested in. So the hybrid phaser EMT approach is a convenient way for us to localize areas of interest for full EMT study, but still honor the system level operation and capture that bus condition that's ultimately the connection with the, the EMT area. The way that we achieve this within Simulink is to use model reference to connect a phaser simulation with an EMT simulation. Back to MATLAB. I'll just show you an example of this. I am going to bring up a model, system level model, in phaser mode, which has an EMT component connected to it. And I'll show you how the connection is made using model reference. So there's our system level model. Just give it a few seconds to load in. So we see the system level model. It's in phaser mode. I have connected an EMT component over here at bus 107. We double click on this. So what do we have here? Well, if this is rendering well in your machine, you may see that we have a Simulink signal going in to this block here which says simple load. So we have a sim power system signal here. Let me go in here. This is the interface that you need to do. You need to pass information through Simulink signals into model reference. So the first thing we need to do is basically bring out voltage and current information. So I have a controlled current source here with a big snubber resistance to avoid an index 2 condition. I'm measuring voltage across it and feeding that through. ALB is an algebraic loop break and in fact it's just a um, single step delay to avoid algebraic loops and I'm also bringing in current from the other block. So let's go back here and let's take a look under simple load. Now the power GUI is set to discrete rather than phaser. So we are running this full EMT, I just done a very simple system, a few pi section lines, got a breaker in place which is going to open and close, just a very simple scenario. If we look at the phaser EMT block here, slightly different from what we saw, we're bringing in a phaser voltage measurement, we need to then convert that to an EMT a sinusoidal waveform, so we need to bring that in, sine with appropriate frequency, but the measurement that we're making on current we need to basically align with a, using a phase lock loop to get that waveform in order to get the phaser from that EMT wave which we can then feed back into the phaser. So that's how it's done. We're saving the EMT data to a file called VI01MAT and that's how we set the system up. Now the model reference is a standalone model. 
So if I had other EMT configurations available, I could click, right click on the block and go to block parameters and type in the model name. So I might have a wind farm, a wind turbine, a solar farm, an individual solar cell perhaps. I mean, uh, you know, you can have a various EMT components or systems that you might want to connect in and, and view the behavior. And this can be done simply by connecting or simply by naming the model you want to connect through model reference. Of course, it would have to have the same connection. In this phase, case, it's single phase. You could do two phase and three phase connection as well. So, and you could also programmatically set this. So you can programmatically change the, the reference. So if you were looking at different model fidelities or different model types or technologies, you could run this all programmatically to automate the process. Just going to run this. What it's going to do is it's going to compile the system, link the model reference and then run. And once it's done that, we'll take a look at some of the data to make sure that we are indeed seeing EMT waveform as well as as well as phaser. So you can see there it's just updating and now it's evaluating the block parameters and then it will run momentarily. One thing to note here with the the hybrid phaser EMT simulation is you need to select a step time which will allow the detailed EMT waveforms to be constructed. So in this case I'm using 20 microseconds. The phaser simulation is also using that as its update rate but because the phaser simulation does not have any states to update it's still very rapid so there's still a significant time savings with this hybrid approach for this type of simulation. Simulation is now over so let's go to the data. I'm going to load the EMT waveform. So we'll look at voltage and there we see the, the EMT response. So we can do hybrid EMT simulations using this approach of model reference and then using phase lock loops on the EMT side so we can generate the phaser and then bringing the phaser through to the EMT, we just need to construct the EMT waveform from magnitude and angle with the appropriate system frequency. final topic we're going to look at today is you know, how we can investigate smart management strategies. We're just looking at one particular example in the webinar. But the reason that we want to do this, I mean this is a no-brainer as well, but smart grid technologies provide an infrastructure to consider automated management strategies that aim to improve certain aspects of grid operation. The way that we can look at those within MathWorks tools is we can look at smart management using optimization techniques for example and then we can test those on system level models. And the case that we're going to look at is demand response or, or smart charging of, of vehicles and the demand response aspect is to look at how we can modify charging patterns on vehicles such that we basically reduce the peak load on a certain phase. So let's let's take a look at that. I'm going to run a certain example which is going to look at 50 plug-in vehicles over a 24-hour period and look at how optimization can be used to basically smooth out the load profile over that period of time. Now it does assume that we've got perfect knowledge of when vehicles are going to be connected but you know it's a start point. So let me just run this script and then we can look at some of the responses here while it's running. So on the left green is the load profile over the 24 hour period of the the phase that we're connecting the 50 plug-in vehicles to. Red is the load if we are charging the, those 50 vehicles using what we can call a flat charging profile, so just a constant charge in order to achieve full charge within a certain period of time. So we can see that it, it's got a very similar pattern to
to the to the basic load without the plugins. If I zoom in, we'll get to this plot in a minute. Excuse me. If I zoom in, we can look. There's 50 overlaid plots here, but you can see that there's flat charging patterns, which has resulted in this large load over the 24-hour period. Figure two here is just visually showing the 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 yellow is when the vehicles are actually plugged in over the 24-hour period. So I just randomly set this up, and the constraints I gave the optimization was to say, okay, when a vehicle plugs in, it has a certain charging requirement. You must achieve that charge requirement in the time that this vehicle will be plugged in. You may change the hourly by hourly charge pattern, but you must ensure that the vehicle is fully charged when it disconnects. And those were the constraints. There was also some constraints on, on charging magnitude as well. And what comes out of that is this plot here on the right, the smart charging profile. So we can see that we have flattened the load compared to the flat charging profile. So whereby, you know, peak went up to about 2.6, we were able to bring peak load down below 2 over the 24 hour duration. And you can see visually that we've got some movement now in the charging patterns caused by the optimization routine. So this is quite a stylized example, but it does demonstrate how optimization tools can be used to look at the operation or using smart technology as the underpinning technology. The question from this becomes one of, well, it's all very well that you've done this with a simplified example. What happens if those charging profiles were then to be brought in and actually executed on the network? What voltage and currents would we see? Would there be any system behavior which would be of concern to us? We want to do a system level study on this now that we have these charging profiles in place. And to perform this, I went down the path of model reference again. I'll just go to the appropriate directory. And what I'd done was I created a model reference. Here it is, test feeder SC1, which has 50 plug-in vehicles. And in this case, I modeled them. Just zoom in. I modeled them as constant PQ, and I'm just bringing in active power in this case. And what's being read in here is the charging pattern. So the charging pattern is being automatically read in from the optimization. So I have a string, single phase string, where I'm connecting 50 vehicles in. I have the standard connection that we saw before, but now I'm in phaser mode in the model reference. So I do not need the PLL. I can just pass through phaser information. It simplifies the connectivity. But because I have a standalone model here, I can connect that model programmatically to any portion of the network I want. So in this case, actually you see here 40 seconds to perform the optimization. And the optimization satisfied the constraints that were given. So anyway, back to this script here. What I'm doing is I'm connecting the string to different phases and different locations. So this string of 50 plug-in vehicles, I have a function called add SC. Let me just open that. It's showing you how it's adding. So it's finding the appropriate bus, it's getting its position, it's adding the block at the position and making the connection. I'm doing this with phase A, phase B, and phase C and then simulating and saving the data appropriately. I'm not going to run this today because it does take a little bit of time to do this, more time than I think would be willing to, to sit through while it churns away. But what I did do is I ran it earlier and we can take a look at some of the data. So what I'm going to do is take the snippet of code which shows the figures. So we see here during after the run it saves that data and then there's some figures. I'm actually going to very quickly construct another script which loads that data and provides the same figures. 
save this. Well, actually, I don't need to save it. I can just step through the, the sections. So I'll run and advance, loads of data, and then shows the figures. So what we're seeing here is the active power at the bus with the flat charging patterns and the smart pattern. So we can see that we have indeed smoothed out at the point of connection the active power, as we might expect. But we did look to verify that with the more detailed simulation. That's going to be the same for the others. Active power is active power on the constant power load. And we can start looking at voltages. So this is not available within the optimization, but we can see that the voltage profile is flattened as a consequence of the smart charging profile. Again, that's to be expected, but we seek verification through simulation. So we do see there that we, we don't have such a variable voltage on C, on B, and on A. So we can run these automated simulations looking to verify the outcome of a less detailed study such as an op or a less detailed application, perhaps an optimization to perform smart charging in this case, and then embed that into the simulation and seek to verify that we're not going to get operation um, that is concerning for us. So we looked at a number of different areas today using the Simulink and Sim Power Systems. They were based around four motivators. First is connecting measured data to simulation. This is an area that's becoming increasingly important given the provision of highly accurate data. We want to make use of that data within the simulation context and so we can directly connect those measurements straight into the simulation environment. We also want to look at how we can generate code from simulation models given that there may be a need to move components of simulations from the Simulink environment and, uh, into other simulation platforms, generating code is the, the first step towards that. But within the Simulink environment, generating code also en enables protection of intellectual property and also the speeding up of simulations. We then looked at how to apply some data analytics to the, the outcome of simulation studies and in particular looking at cases where we have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of results and we're looking to use statistical analysis to bring some statistical significance to the observations we're making on the, the simulation studies. And we also looked at optimization with simulation. Optimization is becoming increasingly important in a number of different areas whether it be calibrating generation equipment models whether it be optimal sizing and placement of devices, or whether it be optimized operational profiles and how that fits into the simulation. There are a number of different ways in which optimization can be applied. We looked at one specific example today. So thank you for attending the webinar. If you want more information on upcoming events or products, please visit mathworks.com.